Hello from the Lowy Institute in Sydney. We're coming to you this morning from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and we pay our respects to the traditional owners and their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Shane McLeod. I'm the project director here at the Australia Papua New Guinea Network at the Institute. We work to connect people between our two countries and given the limits on the ability for us to do that in person at the moment, we're pleased to be able to host this event today online. We're able to do that thanks to the ongoing support of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and also our event sponsors, Coca-Cola Amatil and Bank South Pacific. Unfortunately, it's not a positive story we have to tell today. COVID-19 has dominated lives around the globe for more than a year. The story in PNG today is especially difficult. Since the start of February, official case numbers in PNG have quadrupled. Officially, 91 people have died, but the reality is likely many, many more people have succumbed to the virus. Port Moresby has been bearing the brunt of the outbreak with high case numbers and sick patients overwhelming hospitals. International medical teams have arrived to help and so have vaccines, but there's a huge task ahead to try to bring the pandemic under control. And that's in the capital. In Penji's provinces, the virus has also been taking a terrible toll. After cases were confirmed from Manus earlier this month, the virus has now been officially detected in all of PNG's 22 provinces. But as to how the provinces are contending with the virus, we've heard less. We know that provincial hospitals have at times been overwhelmed, that testing has been difficult to access, data poorly gathered and misinformation a major challenge. We're fortunate today to have with us three panellists who can shed some light on the situation in PNG beyond the capital. First to Vanamo, where we have Dr. Stella Jimmy from the West Sepik Provincial Health Authority. Good morning to you, Dr. Jimmy. Good morning, Shane. Now, you're the Provincial COVID-19 Response Coordinator. Dr. Jimmy is also a paediatrician by profession, and she's the Director of Curative Health Services with the Provincial Health Authority. Next, we go to Garoka, where we have Dr. Pamela Tolliman joining us from the Institute of Medical Research. Good morning, Dr. Tolliman. Now, you're a senior research fellow and you're part of the IMR's team supporting the national COVID-19 response. And you're also working on validation of antigen rapid diagnostic tests in the PNG context. So we'll be talking to you more about that shortly. Finally, to Melbourne, where we have Thanks. Professor Brendan Crabb, CEO of the Burnett Institute. Professor Crabb, uh, we might be having a video issue with you there. We will get Dr. Crabb back on the line. Uh, Dr. Crabb is intimately familiar with health in PNG, uh, as well as his research into malaria. He also has an interest in newborn and maternal health. He's also actively involved in Australia's COVID-19 response. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to your contributions, Brendan. Now, the technology is a little against us this morning. We've had a few issues getting, getting started, and our apologies if you were trying to watch us via our Vimeo link. Unfortunately, that platform has not been available for us this morning. We hope if you are watching us, you can share our Facebook link and get people connected to you as well. Brendan, you're back. Great to see you there. I might go first to Vanamo, to Dr. Jimmy, um, and to ask you about the experience you've had there in Vanamo with the pandemic. We know that uh, earlier this year you were hit particularly hard, particularly early with the surge in case numbers. What's the experience been like and, and where are things at now in West Sepik province? Yeah, Shane, um, we got hit the, at, the, at the most weakest point. The thing that we dreaded, we didn't uh, want to happen to us, did happen to us. Um, with the uh, health workers being the most affected, um, when we had that uh, our third case for the province actually, when uh, on the third of uh, sorry, the twelfth of February, and um, this case was unlike the ones the two we saw last year. Uh, we had very quick transmission of the infection amongst the health workers in the hospital, and um, that almost brought us to our knees because a significant number of the health workers were affected and we couldn't sustain the services. So we just have to scale down to emergency services. And the uh, infection just uh, spread very rap rapidly within the admin setting uh, with um, clusters, uh, a number of clusters happening in town. Uh, we had a close setting in the prison and uh, also in the community. So the numbers just um, rose very quickly for us in, 
and we didn't have the like the capacity to manage if that was to continue. Um, so we had to institute some aggressive measure initially to have a lockdown in the province, two weeks lockdown to try and have a control of this uh, outbreak, which we did have some control and uh, we brought it under control and um, uh, we have all recovered and uh, health facilities are now back in operation, especially the hospital and the district hospital that were uh, both affected at, at the same time. So, when so we have uh, resumed services and the number of cases have uh, gone down. When you're dealing with an outbreak like that, what are the things that you found that you needed the most? Like, What was effective for you in being able to get a hold of the, the, the scale of the outbreak, but also to, to quickly respond to it? I think the, the thing that we identified that we really needed the most at the time was um, the human resource, the health workforce. So with the, like for my hospital, we had um, five of the doctors and that's like five out of the seven doctors we had at the time going into quarantine and isolation. So that just, uh, we were just not able to manage. So the thing we identified that, that, that we really needed was the health workforce to support us at the time, but uh, we did not help have that help immediately. So we just had to uh, make do with what we have on the, the workforce that's on the ground, reorganize, rearrange our services, and uh, seek help from our neighboring um, um, province, ECP, Provincial Health Authority, to at least send us, um, they send us three, two of their doctors across to just see the services through the first two weeks when we were all in isolation and quarantine. Dr. Tullyman, I might come to you and get a bit of a sense of how things have been in Garoka, because I know in the Eastern Highlands, you've had a, a quite a sharp outbreak as well. And a lot of it centered, I gather, on the university. But what's it been like being in Garoka and trying to, I guess, contend with a pandemic like this while you're directly involved in the national response? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Shane. Um, we are in Garoka. That's the headquarters of where the um, PNG Institute of Medical Research. Um, oh, we may have increased the cases in sleep. Oh, we're getting you back, I think, Pamela. Just hold on Am a I sec. Back? And yeah, you're back. Go for it. All right. Yeah, thanks. We've um you're right, you're correct in saying that the um, Eastern Highlands has seen a, a an increase. That's that's been the Case. There was a, initially an outbreak within the university, but um, you know it's fair to say that there is widespread and sustained community transmission in the province. Um, in the last week, we reported the province reported 92 new cases. Um, and apart from the NCD and Western Province, I think uh, Eastern Highlands is the the next um, province uh, that reported the, the most uh, number of cases in the country. And is it a situation that's under control now, or is it something that's still causing a big challenge there for your provincial health authorities? Look, I think I think it's it's interesting when you talk about control. Uh, I think it's it's hard to gauge when we are still really needing to test um, and, and gauge the, the extent of the problem. So I think it's kind of difficult to, for me to say whether something uh, the situation is under control or not. Um, I'm, I think that um, we have had issues with um, resources on the ground. Um, I know in March we continue with the testing, um, so that's been a challenge. Um, but it's 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 very uh, challenging when um, on the streets people we know that there is transmission in the community, but you uh, are certainly seeing people who are not um, wearing masks and. Um, and social distancing in the in in in, in community is um, is uh, you know you're not really seeing that so that is a challenge. I'm interested to know from your colleagues from IMR sites around PNG. You know, is it a similar story? You know, we we do hear about the provinces where there are you know significant case numbers, but we now have a situation where there are cases in every province in PNG. So, uh, are you hearing similar stories in in terms of the impact outside? Yeah, similar similar stories, but but I think as 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 
the, the, yeah, the, the issue, I think, and, and I probably will speak a little bit more on this um, when, we, when we talk about testing, is that that data is captured, that data isn't being uh, captured uh, in the international tally. But um, there's certainly, um, you know, anecdotal cases of people becoming symptomatic, um, but we may not necessarily, um, as with the rest of the country, we may, may not be actually reporting the true number of okay. The true scale of things. We are, we're having a few it's dropouts in your link, but it's, um, it's still pretty remarkable that we can have this video chat between Sydney, Melbourne, Garoka and Vanamo. So we're going to press on. Uh, we'll come back to you shortly, Pamela. I, I want to yeah, go to Brendan sorry. Crabb now in Melbourne. Um, Brendan, you have uh, amazing connections in PNG. You, uh, through the Burnett Institute, have operations right across the country. What are you hearing and what are you hearing are the real challenges in provinces in PNG? Well, well, thanks, Shane, and thanks for putting this event on. And it's fantastic to hear from people who are actually there, experts like Dr. Jimmy and Dr. Polyman. Thanks so much. And I know that there's connection issues, but it's just precious, very precious to hear from people on the ground. I'm not, I'm in Melbourne. Um, Burnett uh, is also very provincial, obviously in Britain and the Western province are a focus uh, for us. And, and clearly in those places, we're hearing uh, really significant stories of COVID as a, as a problem, all of our connections, all of our staff, you know, and, and hospitals and the health services there are, are under really serious pressure from COVID. I mean, I got interested, very interested a month or so ago. I've been um, interested for more than a year and there have been programs in PNG, uh, both from the Australian side and the PNG side that I've had a hand in. But a month or so ago, we started to realise we were in an unexpected emergency and and Dr. Tolman's already said that the, the testing doesn't um, paint the real picture. Um, I mean, I'm going to stick my neck out and say that that there's 10,000 cases which is confirmed is a very, very significant underestimate. I say that for a number of reasons. One is we know that testing is symptomatic and it won't get all the symptomatic people, maybe by a factor of three, four or five. Already, that means there are really 30,000, 40,000 cases. Then there are all the asymptomatic people in PNG who will be transmitting the virus. Now, in PNG, that's a lot higher than many other countries because the age demographic, the average age in PNG is just 22. And so there will be a lot higher rates of, um, uh, of asymptomatic carriers in PNG than in most in, in Western countries. So, so that means we're, we're now up to something like 100,000 or 200,000 people um, positive. And that fits much more, in fact, it's still an underestimate, with the sentinel cases, sentinel groups like pregnant women in NCD at 8% positive, um, uh, for example, and, and our NGO partners having similar sort of numbers, 10% of staff, 20% of staff. So there really is every likelihood we're closer to 100,000 people positive now, even as a, as a low estimate, and for reasons Dr. Tolleman said, still going north. So we desperately need testing to tell us that true. Am I right I mean, in that estimate? Um, but we know the number is way more than 10,000. We also know it's going like this, a steep slope up. So um, the last month has been trying to raise the alarm, especially in Australia, but also in PNG. Uh, that we have something we didn't expect, uh, I certainly didn't expect, uh, to be happening at this pace and at this scale. Brendan, thanks for that. We might go to Dr. Jimmy in Vanamo because I am really interested in this question of testing. So can you give us the situation for you there in Vanamo? If a patient presents at Vanamo General Hospital today um, and you think that they're a COVID case, what resources do you have available to you to, to test and to find out if that person is a positive COVID case? Okay, we now have the cartridges available to us for the gene expert testing. We have that machine in the hospital and we have also been given the antigen testing. Uh, so we have these two tests um, available for us on the ground and um, that we can do. Okay, so that's that's okay, Shane, for us at the admin setting to do that testing. 
Um, our challenge for the province in terms of testing is the the just the operation to operationalize these things to um, expand the testing uh, uh, in the province is a, is an issue for us given our challenges with the um, the logistics that's in, involved and the just the the geographical isolation and the challenges that we have to reach and uh, bring the samples in is is just a fit in itself. Um, trying to mobilize all these things and organize the testing, scale up testing. Um, so at the district hospitals, at the urban setting, it's it's okay. We have these things, but um, it's the when we go out to the district to scale up, that, that that's a big challenge for us to increase our testing capacity. And I'm guessing at the moment that testing is focused on people who are either symptomatic or where you know they've been in close contact with someone who is a positive case. So it's not, it's not surveillance testing at this point, and you're not really able to go much beyond what you can do there in Banamo. Yes, uh, more or less, we, we are, uh, it's um, based on our ILI and SARI surveillance at the health facility settings and uh, contact tracing of positive cases. Uh, but then this also raises our issues with delay in uh, uh, reporting of results that have been sent externally in uh, following up on the positive cases context. Yeah, so that data kind of reporting and gathering, do you mean what, what you're reporting back to the national level or what you're able to track and trace locally? Uh, locally, we can, when we do the testing locally, we can uh, immediately do the contact tracing. It's the tests that have been sent externally that, that there has been delays in the release reporting of the results. So it, uh, that's the one that we are having issues with. And that's also contributing to the disparity in our results uh, provincially and also the ones released from the National Control Center. And how big a problem is that, do you think, in terms of knowing the scale of the, the outbreak? Um, like I said, because we have these delays in uh, releasing of the results, reporting back of the results, you see, uh, by the time we get back the results, they're already over two weeks and uh, people have already gone past the quarantine isolation period. Um, and now uh, we don't have that like fresh information to be chasing up on the context. So uh, that makes it a big issue for us on the ground in trying to keep abreast with them. Uh, evolution of the outbreak on the ground. All right, I'll go to Dr. Toliman now in Goroka. Um, Dr. Toliman, you, you're involved in some of the work to verify, I guess, and, and see the value that these um, rapid tests can, can do in, in tracking and tracing and identifying the scale of the pandemic in PNG. How far are they being deployed at the moment? What have been the issues in sending them out there and what role will they play going forward? Well, they're incredibly important, Shane. Um, um, they're absolutely Dr. Jimmy's comments about how um, it's been incredibly frustrating for um, clinicians and disease control officers um, to contend with the long turnaround time. I absolutely acknowledge that. Um, you know, uh, the, the three kind of districts or provinces that are that are on the on the tally as having the largest number of cases reported. Uh, are centres where or provinces where there's been a lot of support for testing. So you've got NCD, a lot of resources have been mobilised uh, for testing in Port Moresby. Um, in the Eastern Highlands, you have the, the, the IMR is situated here and has been able to support the um, Eastern Highlands Provincial Hospital and the PHA here. And in Western Province, Octeti Mining Limited has shown incredible leadership in supporting uh, the, the diversity of and reach and strength of the health um, areas that um, have really uh, don't have that same kind of level of support um, in, um, in testing and, 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 and other kind of um, responses. Um, the uh, the pan-bio COVID antigen test has been um, approved for rollout in the country and um, these test kits should be in the process, if not already um, delivered to PHAs throughout the 
the, the, the country to really, um, uh, you know, fill that gap um, in testing and being able to have, um, you know, a test result to guide management. Um, they, uh, as you know, they are rapid. They're meant to be used and, and have a quick turnaround. So PanBio will give a result within 30 minutes, and that's incredibly important um, to make a management decision. Um, the IMR has been involved uh, in um, validating, and we will continue to keep um, to the partnership with the NDOH and other partners like Octeti uh, Mining Limited in um, validating different um, tests and technologies as they become available for um, validating for use within the PNG context. So really thinking about different um, use case scenarios and guidelines as to how they should be uh, used. Um, as um, Professor Crabb mentioned, um, this issue around testing um, asymptomatic um, population is uh, incredibly challenging. So part of this validation is looking at not only the performance, uh, most of these rapid uh, uh, test kits have been um, validated already for use within um, symptomatic cases, so kind of strict kind of clinical presentation. Um, but we there is limited data only in asymptomatic um, cases, and that's exactly the data that we're trying to gather um, to see how we can um, best use these um, new tests and technologies um, to measure the extent of the, the, the infection, for example, in, in a symptomatic um, population. Um, so um, I think recently the um, pandemic, National Pandemic Control Controller issued a directive that um, the uh, pan-bio antigen uh, test that's being uh, rolled out in the country does not require a confirmatory PCR test. So if the, um, the, the antigen test comes back as positive, then it's taken as a positive and um, the, 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 uh, the patient should be managed as such. Um, so that will hopefully uh, cut down the sort of wait time in um, making those decisions around um, clinical management, quarantine, etc. Right. So I might go to Professor Crabb because uh, he was co-author on an article that appeared in Australian newspapers just over the last couple of days talking about things Australia could do to be helping PNG right now. And you talked very much about this testing idea. So what would that involve? What, what can Australia do to help with this testing effort in PNG you know, beyond what's currently been happening, I guess, in terms of shipping samples back and forth to labs in Australia? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Shane. And, uh, and you know, I might go back a step and just say, firstly, from an Australian point of view, I've found our own government's um, attitude to the region and PNG for the whole last year really positive. So it's just been an open door from the Australian side. And, of course, anything that's come from Australia in wanting to assist PNG has been a dialogue with PNG. So, so that side of things has been terrific. I do think, though, that we have all, as I said earlier, been caught a bit by surprise, given how well PNG has managed things for the last 12 months. I guess this, this sudden surge uh, came as a bit of a surprise. So we're talking about what can Australia do in this emergency situation that differs from what it was doing and planning to do over the next a year or two. Uh, and the testing, I guess there were three major components to what Australia can offer. The first is um, non-vaccine help in intervention. And the top of the list there is testing, um, but of course uh, PPE, for, for healthcare workers, you know, uh, those who are going to come into close contact with COVID cases for other reasons, masks for the general population, um, and and so on and so forth. These non-vaccine related interventions or uh, or tools that we know help so well. The second thing Australia was interested in supporting, and, and I'm not sure how far that's got, is dealing with COVID misinformation, um, which is rife here in Australia and is particularly big in PNG, of course, and the third is vaccines. But you asked specifically about testing, and Pamela has hit the nail on the head. I think there's a huge role for Australia to support PNG rapid tests. Um, 
rapid tests are not what we use here in Australia. We use PCR-based testing, and there are reasons for that. It's not about quality. Um, it, it is, though, about whether the central authorities get to learn about the results of the test. Um, so for PNG, these antigen-based tests, uh, and for their real-time, as Dr. Solomon said, is so important. So we can assist in that regard, but we can also help build lab capacity. Um, you know, the IMR is a shining light, the Central Public Health Laboratories in Port Moresby uh, is a shining light. Um, but, you know, across the country, we need strengthened laboratory capacity. Uh, not going to be super helpful in this next month of the emergency, but in the six months to come and the 12 months to come and the 24 months to come, all of which I think we'll have COVID as an issue, um, that lab strengthening is something Australia could really help support in G. All right. Well, Brendan Crabb, you've mentioned there this uh, issue of misinformation. Uh, this will seem like an interesting segue because uh, we've ended up being here on Facebook today. It's been a very good place to host this video when we had a few tech issues. But Facebook's a massive part of the information ecosystem in PNG. And I'm interested, perhaps first I'll go up to Vanamo and to Dr. Jimmy and ask her how people are getting their information about the COVID-19 pandemic. And how big a factor do you think things like social media are in that general mix of information that people are getting about health? Yeah, that's a big challenge that we have right now in trying to manage this uh, misinformation about the uh, COVID. Um, because the social media is, uh, has had a significant impact on the as a source of information that uh, people have been resorting to. And um, it has, it was, a, and it is continuing to be a challenge for us in trying to get the message for COVID-19 and especially in the people adapting the, what we call the Tupla Pasin, um, adapting to the health protocols of COVID-19. Um, so yes, that, that, that has been, a, it is a big issue for us in, uh, in, in uh, with regard to the social media. Have you been able to overcome it by your own local messaging, by being um, able to speak to people? Have you been able to, given the, the emergency you've been facing, um, is there a role for awareness, community awareness, that type of thing? Yes, we have, um, we have our risk communication uh, and um, team that goes out to do awareness uh, from the coordinating from the provincial headquarters to the district staff. Uh, working with our partners, our stakeholders, uh, disseminating the information, going on the whatever uh, media that is available for us platform, especially the radio. But even though the coverage is not big, but um, as much as possible, disseminating the information that we can get across to all our partners and stakeholders and uh, the community. And even going down, working with our um, uh, local level governments and uh, going down right down to the villages to try to disseminate this information on COVID-19. So Dr. Toneman, I'll come to you because I know the IMR has been very heavily involved in some of the work around information and vaccines. And that has been a, a point of some political contention as well as community contention. How important is it that there are authorities that people can turn to to talk about perhaps their concerns, perhaps the information they're seeing about vaccines and what more can PNG health authorities do to, I guess, smooth the path for a national vaccination program? I think the video... Hi, Shane, am I, am I still online? <laughs> the video just dropped out as soon as you started to chat, but if you go for it, I think we'll keep the video on me and... Yes, I'll... That. Oh, there you are. I think we yeah, can come look, back to you now. <laughs> For many people in Papua New Guinea, Facebook is the internet and it's one of the only portals where they get information and exchange information. Um, it's really incredibly important that um, if you try to battle um, every single piece of misinformation out there, um, you will just struggle and become overwhelmed um, and, and be on the brunt of, of a lot of attacks possibly. Um, I think one of the strategies we try to employ and we need to continue to get better and, and perhaps we need to get more support here is um, where there's sort of a vacuum of information, people will fill it with garbage. So we need to get good 
accurate uh, information that's been, um, you know, uh, process to be able to be um, uh, absorbed by the masses in a quick and easy way and to use um, platform for accurate information. That's incredibly important. So you need to fight by getting good information out there. I, I don't mean to say fight in that way, but, um, you know, in terms of interacting everything. Well, what, what's um, been a concern for me is um, the, um, the, the, the my, um, health workers. Um, and I think, and even the misinformation around within our health worker um, workforce. So I think that's a good place to start, to start with, um, even in the Institute of Medical Research, we've tried to work with our own staff um, because um, that gives you a gauge of possibly what's happening out in the community. Um, so if you kind of can start with your own health workers um, and then kind of look at um, spreading information, good, accurate information, um, Throughout the community. Throughout the community. That's great. Dr. Tolliman, thank you for that. Um, we've got some people who are asking comments, and the place to do it because of the uh, technical situation we're in at the moment is actually back on Facebook. So thanks for watching. And I can see a few people have been asking some questions there. So, what we might do with the last 15 or so minutes of the event today is actually go to some of these questions and I'll get our panelists to uh, give us their responses. Um, the first one I can see, which is um, I think worth sort of bringing up in the, the, the uh, situation where we're talking about testing, was about uh, encouraging people to come forward for testing. So we have a question here. How do you encourage people um, to, to want to get tested? And how do you uh, encourage people to use that information and to respond in a community sense? So I might go to you, Dr. Jimmy. I mean, getting people to come forward for a test has it been an issue and what has worked in encouraging people to step forward? Thank you, Shane. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with our health seeking behavior. Um, so that has also what we're seeing with uh, COVID-19. And um, we have some of the things that we have done at the health facility to encourage for uh, testing is separating out the services from the general services, so making uh, services separate and um, specific for people with respiratory symptoms, um, so they don't have to sit in a queue and wait and all these things. So these are some of the in terms of service-wise, uh, um, and also um, making um, the test to be available locally so they can be informed of the results. So now with the antigen testing. Um, that should, uh, I think, improve with the people because that was one of the discouraging thing was that they were not able to get their results immediately and know what the status are. Uh, but I think with the rollout of the antigen and us encouraging more people to come in, but like I said, it's still a challenge because of the health-seeking behavior. Uh, and then the association of the, the, the disease, COVID-19, and the implications that go with it when you are diagnosed as uh, COVID-19 and the... Um, and I think uh, from the perception that we're, that we're getting is uh, people not wanting to be quarantined and going into isolation. And then um, like uh, Professor Kreb has said, uh, majority of our people, uh, given the, the population pyramid are young and they're mostly asymptomatic and the symptoms are very mild. Uh, people just disregard these symptoms because of our health seeking behavior. And uh, they, they will not come to the hospital because they have a small, you know, minor minor cold or sneezing or a small fever. These are things that really, um, they disregard this kind of symptoms. So they, they will not present unless they're very sick. Then they um, uh, come to the hospital. All right, Dr. Jimmy, thank you. I've got one here, which is for Dr. Tolliman, which... Uh, Asked, you've been a strong leader promoting evidence-based medicine and reliable information, and as a consequence, you personally have suffered some social media attacks uh, from groups that are opposed to things like vaccination. So this is a question from someone working in the health sector. What advice do you have for health workers who are dealing with that kind of attitude, that kind of, uh, uh, I guess, criticism that they're facing in the field? 
I think um, I, I think consistently we think about serving our people, and we we need to um, in a in a kind of a, a, a humble and approachable way just convey um, that we are in, in the field of service to people. So it is um, you know some things are clear. The response um, needs to be um, you know locally defined and locally led. Um, and this is the this is the way in which we can gently and respectfully move our people to a place so they can understand and and respond to the the, the present danger that we we face. So um, it's been an interesting journey and in kind of understanding that you um, behavior doesn't change overnight, um, and 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 set views don't change overnight. But we need to continue to be consistent in our messages. We need to kind of put service. Um, you know, at the forefront to say to people, this isn't about, um, you know, curtailing their, their, their liberties and their movements. This is about the good of our communities, the health of our communities, the well-being of our country. Um, that's sort of been the I've kind of the position I've taken um, personally. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Ginny will add to that. Um, she might have some experiences of how she sort of, um, you know, responded. Yeah, Dr. Jimmy, would you like to respond to that? How you deal with that sort of that uh, approach you might get from patients who um, uh, have been informed, I guess, by that misinformation? Uh, sorry, Shane, I didn't hear the question. I'll just ask you if, if you've had similar experiences to Dr. Tolliman, how you how you encourage your healthcare colleagues to push back against misinformation that might be being brought forward by patients? Yes, um, we have organized within our organization, uh, within the PHA, uh, targeting our health staff, getting the organizing in a uh, structure wise, uh, setting up our systems from the provincial headquarters right down to the districts. Uh, to the health facility and having forums in place and getting the message to be uh, delivered, uh, same message delivered to all our health workers and um, uh, and having uh, um, common forums and workshops and things like that in uh, getting our staff through all these things with uh, COVID because we've had a whole year of preparation in trying to um, get our staff um, prepared and um, especially dealing with the fear of COVID and all these things and in managing the patients with COVID. So we put a lot of work into getting our staff on board with this. And um, it has paid off our staff. Uh, and then we've experienced it firsthand with uh, us getting the infection itself and going through the experience and coming out of it. So I think that has put, uh, brought us to another place in our experience with uh, COVID and managing and handling COVID. We are more confident now in going forward with uh, COVID. Professor Crabb, can I come to you and ask you about vaccines and this, I guess, slightly tricky situation that Australia's in now regarding vaccines. Australia's having issues with the rollout of vaccines and has made some medical recommendations about the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is very much central to the COVAX project and it's rolling out around the world and in countries including Papua New Guinea. Is Australia in a tough spot trying to support vaccination in PNG given the differing messages that are sort of being sent for the Australian audience versus what uh, I guess is the situation in Papua New Guinea? Well, yes, they are in a tough spot, but in a tougher spot than they should be. And the challenge is what's just been talked about in the last two or three topics. The, the, the theme that's run through that is misinformation lack of education, lack of community understanding. So, so in support of both what Dr. Jimmy and Dr. Tolman have been saying, but extending it a step further than, than just trying to manage Facebook and getting good information out there, the, the most important thing in countering misinformation is leadership. Leadership politically, we, and I'm so pleased to see uh, the Prime Minister Morape get immunised, that sort of thing is so important. But leadership from any group that has respect within the province or a community, church groups, um, private sector, um, sporting heroes and so on, that sort of uh, 
leadership is so important in, in setting the tone for what ends up on Facebook and in any other uh, media source. And so to your point, point about vaccines, here we are finding ourselves in this, in this deep worrying discussion about a vaccine that is fantastically good, um, efficacy compared to any uh, vaccine, somewhere in the range of 75 to 85% effective against symptomatic COVID and 100% effective against um, hospitalisation and death. And that is incredibly safe, So, uh, but not perfectly safe, as are most uh, I- interventions. So we find ourselves in this, in this controversy that I find grossly overblown, but, but there we are, and it needs to be countered with this, with this leadership. The situation with the AstraZeneca vaccine, it and vaccines like it, which are adenovirus-based vaccines that are largely heat-stable and, and, and relatively inexpensive, so easy to move around countries, easy to store in fridges, and easy to get to people. Um, adenovirus vaccines like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that it's another one, uh, Russian Sputnik V vaccine that is also very promising. They're all adenovirus-based. They're the only realistic option for the near term for many countries in the world, and including Australia for a large proportion of the population of Australia. Um, and I and I just encourage ways to find people to, em- to embrace them. We have a blood clot issue that affects uh, something like four or five in a million people and may be fatal in one in a million people who get immunised. Now, that's, of course, a terrible, terrible outcome. Um, but even blood clots themselves are a much higher frequency problem in COVID-positive people than they are in COVID-immunised people, let alone the effects of COVID itself. So we find ourselves in this tricky situation because of that one big elephant, which is uh, you know, misinformation, poor communication, poor storytelling, poor linking up to the community, as, as has been said by, by Dr. Tolman and Dr. Dr. Jimmy. Um, where they really need to be educated and uh, and and finding solutions themselves uh, to to um, communicating the messages to their to, to their communities in the right way. It's a fabulous vaccine. It'd be a tragedy if um, things stand in the way of either Australians or Papua New Guineans in this case getting immunised with it. And some really positive comments just in the last couple of days, I think, from uh, senior officials here in Australia talking about the opportunity given what's happening in Australia now in terms of prioritising other vaccine options, um, that there may be a greater supply available from Australia as well. So um, I'm keen to hear from our colleagues who are joining us from the provinces of PNG. Dr Tollyman, what have you heard about the vaccine? What have you heard about when it might be available for you in Garoka? Um, so far, no news. Um, we are um, checking every day. Um, I, I really can't um, offer any kind of happy news as to where, when the um, we in the Eastern Highlands or even in the Institute of Medical Research um, will be getting the vaccine. Um, I wish I knew to be able to share. Um, but we, I mean, for me personally, I'll take any vaccine. Um, it's very, very um the generous um, uh, vaccines in the first instance, and then and then the the COVAX supply um, being mobilised is is really promising news. I think um, we just hope that there is a transparent um, uh, distribution of the the vaccine to the provinces where they are most needed, um, and um, just continue to work with trying to get um, accurate information out there uh, to, um, you know, quell fears and to just reassure people that um, this is an incredibly important um, step that we as a country need to take. Um, but it needs to also, um, you know, the import, it's, it's vaccine, we're talking about vaccination coverage, which is incredibly important. And we're also, as Professor Crabb mentioned, we still have to promote along with vaccination these non-pharmaceutical interventions like Mask Wearing Institute has been very clear in its support of the um, 
government um, you know, uh, rollout of AstraZeneca uh, as an institute. We fully support it. Um, it is um, it is safe and it, it is efficacious. It's really it's effective. It will um, prevent uh, severe disease and so incredibly important for our population. And I'll come to Dr. Jimmy in just a sec, but while we do that, I'll just remind you, if you do have a question to ask, uh, do add it as a comment on the video here on Facebook and we'll do our best to get it to the panel. Um, Dr. Jimmy, any news for vaccines for you there in West Seapick province? Um, we've had that they're working on consigning for the Momaste region, which we fall under, but that we have not been given a specific date. Nonetheless, we have already made our preparations in the province in the things that we need to get in place uh, before the vaccine arrives. And uh, so that program is in place and we're just waiting. Uh, but we've set our date uh, locally for the 17th of May uh, for the rollout of the vaccination in the province. Uh, not too far away and I uh, hope everything goes well in terms of the logistics for you. Um, there's a couple of comments here about vaccines and some of the reluctance, the vaccine hesitancy being um, the case of people worried about side effects. So perhaps if I can go back to you, um, Professor Crabb, the side effects that we're hearing about in terms of the general side effects uh, when people get the AstraZeneca jab. Um, what are you hearing? It doesn't sound like it's too bad, but there's sort of headaches, perhaps a little bit of fatigue. I mean, is that out of order? Would you expect that kind of thing? And for people who don't know much about the vaccine, is that something to be concerned about? It's not something to be concerned about, but it is real. And it's real with most vaccines. It depends on, on which ones you get. And it's, it's because of what they're trying to do. A vaccine is um, something that goes into your body to stimulate your immune system. So when it goes into your body, you get a, a rush of cells uh, of your immune cells to the region. You get these chemicals, natural chemicals released to give you uh, immunity at that point in time to what vaccine is. But of course, that's going to give you immunity to the infectious disease itself. So the, the fever and the headaches and so on that in some people, I got vaccinated a week ago and I didn't have those symptoms, um, but, but a number of other people of my colleagues did have, did have those symptoms, some of which felt they couldn't come to work a day or two afterwards. So symptoms for 24 to 48 hours are very common with, with any vaccine and most certainly with AstraZeneca uh, of that sort. They're nothing to be worried about. They are to be expected. And they're a sign that you're generating a good immune response to the virus, which is which is exactly what you what you want. So it's real, but nothing to be concerned about. All right, getting another a couple of other interesting comments and some suggestions here as well. Um, one that suggests that uh, perhaps one of the um, strategies that might help with vaccine take up would be publicising the the risks of uh, the, the virus itself versus the vaccine. Um, Dr. Tolliman, do you think that's cutting through to people? Do you think people are aware of the risks of the virus itself or is it part of that misinformation sense that people aren't too worried about uh, the impact that they might get from the virus? Yeah, it's difficult when you have um, the majority of, of, of cases um, that are asymptomatic and um, uh, or mildly symptomatic. Uh, I, I think the... the the uh, NDOH and partners like the WHO have produced materials to sort of uh, to to um, educate uh, people about the, the complications that can arise and 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 sort of what to expect kind of clinically when you have COVID. But um, if people, if there's not sort of a connection between personal risk and personal danger, it, it is difficult for people to really appreciate that. Um, and even for them to not only think about themselves, but think about their role um, in transmitting um, to people who could be more, more vulnerable than them to, um, you know, to in terms of uh, severity of, of clinical presentation and possibly death. So keep our messages uh, consistent and we just have to not be relentless in getting that information out there. 
There's some great questions coming through and it makes me think that there's probably a whole program we could do just talking about vaccines and, and questions people have about them. But a good one here, just the shelf life of the, the AstraZeneca vaccine that's um, at the centre of the PNG rollout. Um, perhaps it's one for you, Professor Crabb, just in terms of the shelf life, how long um, do vaccines actually last in storage before they can de be deployed? And is that going to be an issue, do you think, in, in a rollout in PNG? Well, all vaccines last for a long time in the right sort of cold storage. Uh, but, but for the mRNA vaccines in particular, that cold storage is, is logistically really challenging. You know, so for the, the vaccines that we're not talking about here, um, uh, you know, the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines that get so much attention, their downside is their long-term storage has to be at minus 70 degrees, which is an unusually cold freezer really hard, even in a wealthy country like Australia, to have that distributed well throughout um, the country. Um, but other vaccines can get stored for a long period of time, like AstraZeneca, at a much lower freezing. Uh, but it's, it still needs freezing. And then there's the issue of once it's thawed out and is in the fridge, how long is it going to last? And so sort of not indefinite, but a long, you know, we're talking three, six, 12 months in the freezer, maybe even longer for some vaccines. Uh, and then once they're thawed out, how long have you got? And what you hope for is that you have days or a week thawed out in the fridge, and that's the sort of time frame for, for AstraZeneca, rather than just a matter of hours, which is what the concern was for some of the mRNA vaccines. You know, you thawed them out, then your, your patient's not there to immunise, and so you have to throw the vaccine out. So one of my comments earlier was about the stability of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And that's a big advantage of it, that it can be stored uh, in a low temp lower temperature freezer and survive for quite a long time in a normal refrigerator, uh, which gives it a lot of flexibility for transport and for practical use in clinics and, and health services, wherever they might be. Professor Crabb, thank you. Now, I realise we're right at the end of our event today. So what I thought I would do just at the end here is just to very quickly go around to each of our three panellists. And just uh, if I could get your thoughts, and I'll come to Dr. Jimmy first, just in terms of next steps in, in how PNG responds to this pandemic, um, your thoughts on the priorities from where you are in West CPIC. Um, what are the immediate things that will help your region and your town to deal with uh, COVID-19? Okay, Shane, I am at the border province, uh, the international border with the Republic of Indonesia. Um, that's, the, that's one of our biggest uh, challenges at the moment is going forward, living with COVID-19 along the border, uh, because uh, we've had issues, ongoing issues and challenges in managing our border uh, in terms of people uh, crossing the border. So that's one of the issues that we have is to find a way uh, forward of living with COVID-19 um, along the border. Um, especially in terms of our trade and uh, all the activities that we usually do along the border and uh, uh, taking, on, uh, taking on board the COVID-19 as well. Um, secondly, we are using the COVID-19 as an opportunity for us to strengthen our health systems and uh, because a lot of things um, are not in order and not right. So... We are using it as an opportunity to a uh, stepping stone to build on it, to improve our infection control practices. That's within our health system. And uh, of course, the other thing is uh, protecting the population and getting our people to understand the disease and uh, cooperating with us as we move forward in the rolling out of the vaccination that is coming on board next month. So that's the immediate thing that we are looking at now is to um, get our people to understand that and uh, cooperate in the vaccination. So, but otherwise we have all, all these other long-term things that uh, our health uh, system has suffered and, and uh, a lot of things that we still need to do to uh, build up our health infrastructure and all the things that go with it. Dr. Jimmy, thank you. I'll jump across to Professor Crabb. Some perspectives from you. What do you think are next steps, next priorities in how PNG and perhaps Australia's support for PNG evolves over the immediate future? Well, at a high level, I'm still um, concerned that we haven't, both at an Australian level and at a PNG level, elevated this to the crisis level that 
that I think it's at, but even if it's not there, that we should act as though it is. We've talked a lot today about the fact that we don't have enough information. When you have a, a, a disease like COVID, that the, the, the lessons from the world is we know how bad it can get. When you, um, uh, you, you need to therefore act as though it's a worst case scenario and not just on the numbers you've got. And there's very good reasons to think that we are in a worst case scenario that is going to affect the health of PNG directly, the health of PNG indirectly, the economy of PNG and the economy of the trading partners um, that, uh, that, that PNG has in a really dramatic way. So I would like it, my main comment is an elevated one, elevate this to an even higher level than it already is at the moment. Um, you know, there really could be 1% to 10% of Papua New Guineans infected at the moment, uh, and, and I would not be surprised to see that figure uh, bear out over time. And then my second point is the same as Dr. Jimmy's. Use it as an opportunity, an opportunity for a step change in health services in, in PNG. Now, that may not be so apparent in the emergency of this next month or two, but over the next six months to 12 months to two years, um, we'll be dealing with COVID in PNG on top of other issues. There are lots of innovative ways to integrate services, uh, to, to spend more, of course, uh, but also to integrate services and do them in a cleverer way at a provincial level, at a community-led level. Um, that, that uh, you know, is kind of exciting. So using it in that positive sense as an opportunity, as, as Dr Jimmy says, is my, my, my other message for PNG in Australia. And up to Garoka, Dr. Pamela Tolliman from IMR. What do you think will be the challenges and what are the things that uh, PNG can focus on right now to deal with this emergency situation? Comments um, uh, provided by um, Dr. Jimmy and Professor Crabb. And I think I'll just add that, um, you know, while the advice, support and leadership of, of, of bodies like WHO has been extremely important in shaping that response to COVID-19 in Papua New Guinea, um, the, the government um, and especially the health department has to have the same willingness of engagement with national institutions such as the PNG Institute of Medical Research. Um, the importance of research in generating local and, and contextual evidence can't be over the look pandemic uh, when resources and systems are really stretched. So those are sort of my final kind of comments, but um, thank you for the great discussion. Look, thank you to each of you. I really appreciate you giving up your time today to be part of this. I, I hope for our audience who followed us across here to Facebook uh, after a few technical glitches at the start that you found it a valuable discussion. It is why we're here at the AusPNG Network. We try to facilitate these events to get people talking and to make these connections. And at the moment, we're doing it in this digital format. So thank you each for being part of it today. And thank you to you watching there remotely. We appreciate it and uh, stay tuned. We'll let you know when our next event is coming up. Uh, for now, that's all from the AusPNG Network at the Lowy Institute.